Okay. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started here. Uh, I just wanna give a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here for 2022 Robert L. Kane Memorial Lecture. My name is uh, Joe Gogler. I'm the Robert L. Kane Endowed Chair in Long-Term Care and Aging here in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, where I also direct our Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation, as well as the Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. Uh, those of you who have attended prior Robert L. Kane Memorial Lectures know I like to give a brief overview of both the chair, some of the initiatives the chair is supporting, uh, perhaps most prominently this event, but many other initiatives as well. But more importantly, for all of us to sit and reflect on the formidable legacy of Dr. Kane, um, and really both Dr. Bob Kane and his erstwhile longtime partner, both in scholarship and in life, uh, Dr. Rosalie Kane as well, both of, of whom are no longer with us, but certainly their scholarship lives on. And in one way it lives on is vis-a-vis -vis this annual lecture we put on each year. Again, our, our goal was, as for many of us, was to hold an event of this type in person on the beautiful University of Minnesota campus. When we started planning this event earlier in the calendar year, clearly we weren't in a position to do that. So again, we appreciate your flexibility in joining us vis-a-vis -vis webinar and certainly the flexibility of our Robert L. Kane Memorial Lecture this year, who you're gonna be hearing about more shortly. I always like to begin with the land acknowledgement um, and not just uh, to give it, but also to reflect upon it. Um, and I, I, and I'm, I'm very certain that uh, the values expressed in this acknowledgement will also be evident throughout our presentation today. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. I acknowledge with gratitude the land itself and the people. I take to heart and commit through action to learn and honor the traditional cultural Dakota values, courage, wisdom, respect, and generosity. So before we begin today, I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank the, to thank the Robert L. Kane Chair Executive Committee. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Ashley Millenbaugh, who is the Robert L. Kane uh, Coordinator. Um, she has done tremendous work in getting uh, all of the details together, logistics and otherwise for this event. And again, a big thanks to Ashley for all of her great work over the past year on this. I um, also wanted to specifically thank the members of the executive committee, Patty Cullen, uh, Dr. Phyllis Mullen, Dr. Chris Mul uh, Miller, uh, Adam Suamala, Kari Thurlow, and Alana Wright, all of them representing both the University of Minnesota as well as key partner leading organizations here in Minnesota. They provide invaluable adv advice and guidance to me as a Robert L. Kane Endowed Chair and really have helped shape many of the initiatives and activities the chair has undertook really over these past four years now. So let's talk and really briefly, I wanted to give an overview of the chair itself, what it is and what it means. Um, the original goal of the what was called the Endowed Minnesota Long-Term Care Chair in Aging was to establish long-term care as an academic discipline. It was held by Dr. Bob Kane really from roughly 1990 until his untimely passing in 2017. Um, I think we all know the formidable, formidable legacy of Dr. Kane, what his work meant to the field of geriatrics and specifically to how we understand quality long-term care and quality care for all older people. Uh, much of his work was shaped by these concerns. And uh, my mission as current chair was certainly not to replicate or uh, uh, consider myself uh, worthy of filling these very, very large shoes and the very large shadow of Dr. Kane, but utilizing the resources of this endowed chair, now named after Bob, to continue to build scientific excellence in long-term care, to shape it from a practice policy and pedagogical standpoint. And again, I do that in collaboration with many people, many of you on this call, and again, really with the goal being to serve as a catalyst, to utilize the resources of the chair, both scholarly, financial, and otherwise, to utilize the people power that the chair can embolden, to really enhance aging-specific initiatives, both at the university and beyond. I encourage you to check out the Robert L. Kane webpage to learn more about the chair and the many activities and initiatives it's, uh, it supports. And again, Ashley will be sharing these slides as well as the recording of our event today. 
Some specific initiatives I wanted to highlight for you. Um, clearly, you're here today, and one of our key initiatives that the chair supports is the annual Robert L. Kane Memorial Lecture. This is to celebrate and to highlight a scholar of national and international significance in the space of aging and long-term care, broadly defined. I mean, as you'll see later, uh, certainly our lecturer this year more than embodies uh, those uh, of wonderful achievements. We also support a number of supports for both graduate students as well as postdoctoral students. You see some of them listed here, as well as many community engagement uh, initiatives and activities. I won't go through each of these, but again, the goal has always been to use the chair resources to serve as a catalyst to really build scholarship, education, and community engagement to advance the science of long-term care. One initiative I'll highlight here is the Robert L. Kane Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, our first cohort of postdoctoral fellows, uh, Dr. Zachary Baker and Dr. Monica Kimbang, um, have or are about to end their fellowship period and with great success. Um, we were very excited to have uh, these really exciting junior scholars as part of the Robert L. Kane Postdoctoral Fellowship. Dr. Kimbang is now currently a tenure track assistant professor here in the Division of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health. Dr. Baker is about to, and I don't want to jinx it, but uh, I think all the signs look very good. He is also about to uh, sign and finalize a formal offer to also begin a tenure track position at a uh, wonderful institution as well. I also wanted to announce that uh, Quinton Cotton from the University of Wisconsin will be joining us as our new Robert O. Kane postdoctoral fellow in 2022. Does incredible work on the cultural ramifications of dementia caregiving and the complex decision-making processes that occur in these culturally diverse contexts. And we are just so excited and humbled to have Quinton joining us as well. He's on track to be uh, defending his PhD this summer. And again, we wish him all mm. the support. And again, we just, are excited to have him join us here at the University of Minnesota. Just wanted to conclude here with an overview, uh, really a graphic of the aging ecosystem at the University of Minnesota and how the chair has been involved in, in much of this work. Um, again, I'm not going to belabor or go through what these arrows mean and what each of these acronyms mean. It would take much longer than the time I have. But uh, just suffices, suffices to say the Robert L. Kane Chair has been involved in providing both support vis-a-vis -vis my time, vis-a-vis -vis the excellent coordination that Ashley offers, or vis-a-vis -vis direct financial resources to many initiatives in aging that are going on at the University of Minnesota. Foremost among these is the Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation that is located in our School of Public Health, but really acts as a university-wide center on aging. And then also what we call the Consortium on Aging, which was really an attempt to convene all of these different programs in nursing, the medical school, uh, throughout the university, um, the VA, to come together and to begin talking and setting and, and setting a path towards real robust collaboration in aging and learning what each other does. And uh, one circle that's not highlighted here, but is a major milestone that was just accomplished. Again, I can't say the chair can take any uh, credit for this, but hopefully was at least involved in kind of pushing this forward was the fact that the medical school will now again, after roughly, I believe a 23 year hiatus, will now again, have in place a division of geriatrics and palliative care medicine, which is so important to the scholarship and education and really the work that we do in aging, where we join both the basic science, the applied sciences together with a really robust clinical science aspect. And so again, we're thrilled to help support uh, that initiative as well. Again, you can support the Robert L. Kane Endowed Chair and supporting the chair doesn't mean it supports me as a person or as a professor. It really supports these initiatives. The resources of the chair are really designed to support people, people interested in um, advancing their studies in aging as either undergraduate or graduate students, really supporting junior scholars in the work they're doing to develop a career in aging science and support, or to support those individuals who want to make a professional career in uh, geriatric care. Again, that's what the chair is designed to do. If you ever wish to support the chair, you know, we would be thrilled in any amount in any way. So, and you see some information here, it's very, very easy to donate, both vis-a-vis -vis this link. Um, you see there's a QR code here too you could use if you're um, 
facile enough with your smartphone to do so. You can also always just send a check to me made out to the Robert L. Kane Endowed Chair. And again, this information will be shared to you, shared with you. So with that, that really concludes my introductory overview of the chair. And now I am just thrilled and humbled to present our 2022 Robert L. Kane Memorial Lecture. Um, this is someone whose work I have admired ever since I was in graduate school, um, whose work has served as an inspiration, not just for me, but for many others as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Peggy Dilworth Anderson, I think you will agree with me after her incredible talk she's gonna be uh, giving us here shortly. So Dr. Peggy Dilworth Anderson um, is Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on health disparities and Alzheimer's disease with really an overarching emphasis on building, building knowledge for the scientific and lay community. One of her main scholarly objectives is to utilize this knowledge to inform culturally, color, culturally relevant research and science, but also practice um, in partnership with medically underserved and diverse populations. Dr. Dilworth Anderson is a graduate of the Tuskegee, uh, Tuskegee Institute, and she received her master's and doctorate degrees in sociology from Northwestern University, a renowned institution in a life course uh, research in aging. And she completed her postdoctoral training from the, uh, from, from the Midwest Council of Social Research and Aging. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, as well as the National Council on Family Relations. She has served in multiple leadership capacities. They include the president, of the Gerontological Society of America, which is really the flagship organization for our discipline of gerontology. She's a member uh, of the Global Council on Brain Health uh, for the, at the committees of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. She served on the National Alzheimer's Association Medical and Scientific Council, and it was also a, a member of the National Research Advisory Council of the National Institute on Aging of the National Institutes of Health. She has received many uh, well-deserved recognitions for her rich legacy of scholarship in aging. This includes the Pierman Prize for Excellence in Research on Aging from the University of Southern California's Roybal Institute on Aging. The University of North Carolina also awarded her their University Diversity Award in recognition of her commitment to diversity, inclusion, and research teaching and leadership. She also received the incredibly prestigious Ronald and Nancy Reagan Alzheimer's Research Award for her many, many contributions to Alzheimer's disease in medically underserved communities, again, from the Alzheimer's Association. All of these really reflect Dr. Dilworth Anderson's scholarly legacy, but perhaps just importantly and related, closely tied to the scholarly legacy are the many, many years Dr. Dilworth Anderson has contributed to training and mentorship of graduate students, fellows, junior and mid-career faculty interested in the field of aging. To this end, another award she won was the Minority Task Force Mentor Award from the Gerontological Society of America, as well as the University of North Carolina's Faculty to Faculty Mentoring Award from the Carolina Women's Leadership Council. I know for a fact we have faculty in our division in the University of Minnesota School of Public Health that have been mentored by Dr. Dilworth Anderson, and I'm sure many of you on our webinar today can attest to her excellence in this area as well. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Dilworth Anderson. Thank you for being the 2022 Memorial Lecture and can't wait to hear from you. One quick logistical note, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function or the chat function in Zoom. I will be moderating questions and we'll be directing them to Dr. Dilworth Anderson at the end of our presentation. Please, Peggy. Thank you, Robert. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I have to look in my mirror here in my dining room and say, is that me? Uh, but of course, uh, it is me. Uh, many years of, of doing research and uh, enjoyed most of it. And in fact, I would say almost all of it. Uh, and today I want to share with you some of my ideas that uh, I have developed over time and applied in my own research, in my teaching, and in my mentoring. So the key topics of discussion today will be on race relations, social justice, and clinical research, incorporating social justice ideology and concepts in clinical research, 
and clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease can teach us about social justice, what these trials can teach us about social justice. Then I want to link social justice and clinical research. The next and last part of what I will talk about this afternoon is how do we prepare ourselves to develop an inclusive approach to clinical research relating to Alzheimer's, which incorporates a social justice lens. That then leads us to the discussion and will lead us to the discussion on a need for a paradigm shift in the field and how social justice approach to Alzheimer's disease research can help with this paradigm shift. Next slide, please. So setting the stage, uh, why focus on multicultural and racial, uh, multiracial America? Where there are lots of reasons, but one compelling reason is the notion of the demographics. Where are the demographics today? So we know the white alone adult population decreased almost 75% between 2010 and 2020. The multiracial adult population increased from 2.1 in 2010 to 8.8 .8 in 2020. Now those look like small percentages, but that calculates to a lot of people. So the 276% increase in the US population from 2010 to 2020 led to a 276% increase of our totaling 33.8 million people. The in combination of multiracial populations of all races accounted for almost all the changes in each racial category. So in other words, America is growing in terms of multiracial, multicultural populations. Starting in 2030, when all boomers will be older than 65, older Americans will make up at least one fifth of our population. So if you think about the previous statistics I've cited, the older population will increase. This increase will reflect multicultural and multiracial populations. So by 2060, nearly one in four Americans will be 65 and older. And the number 85 plus will triple and the country will add half a million centenarians. So not only are we evolving or have evolved in terms of multiracial, multicultural, we are evolving in terms of age, older population, and we are evolving and have evolved into very old populations in America. And that, that's a plus for us because it says a lot about what we're doing right in terms of the longevity in the American population. Next slide, please. So some key definitions to frame the discussion this afternoon, and I won't read through all of this. Uh, true to my academic background, I like to put down more words than I need to, but I always feel if I miss something, I haven't said enough. So we will be talking about issues of racism, structural racism, how organized systems create dominant groups in a culture. These dominant groups or subgroups, some people may call them, are perceived and put in inferior positions in a society. The structural racism typically shows up in policies, practices, and norms with a notion of supremacy in certain groups versus another. For example, in America, we talk about white supremacy segregating individuals and groups by racial and ethnic communities. Next slide, please. Then there's systemic racism, where racism is characterized by dominant racial hierarchy, where you have a comprehensive white racial framing, individual and collective dis discrimination, social production of racial material inequities, and racist institutions that dominate the American culture. And then there's institutional where you again see policies and practices. And these are very racialized and membership 
uh, is often based on racial uh, groups. Then there's the internalized racism. It is the acceptance of members of stigmatized races of the negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic work. Now, as an African-American girl at one point in my life, I could not understand uh, why someone would see me as different or inferior. Uh, long before I understood what the word inferior meant, I felt the perception of people thinking that I was less than. And as I grew older and became more informed about what all of that meant, it meant that I was being perceived as less than, could not do better, would not do better than other people that did not look like me. Next slide, please. So how do we now link these kinds of concepts and some other topics that will be discussed to social justice and clinical research? How do we jump from concepts like that to the concept of social justice? And I'm hoping that everyone is thinking about this as we talk and as I discuss this. Social justice encompasses two distinct basic ideas under the underlying themes of justice, fairness, and equity. The first idea is that Individuals should not be denied economic and social, political, cultural, political, civil, or human rights based on the perception of their inferiority by those with more power. Now, if you comprehend it, and I know you have the first idea, you can see how the previous concepts relate to social justice. If someone fosters institutional racism, if someone internalizes the racism, if there's structural racism, then we can see how inferiority is created and superiority is created. And the power influence will vary depending where you fall between superior and inferior. The second idea is that society as a collective must act to ensure the conditions under which people can be healthy in the form of policies and actions that affect societal conditions. So social justice says to us, regardless of whether you perceive yourself as inferior or others perceive yourself as inferior, or there are structures that create inferior conditions for you, social justice says we should act to ensure that we all should be healthy. We have policies that affect conditions that allow us to thrive and to grow and to develop to our fullest potential. So the social justice lens is very critical in my thinking in regards to clinical research, something that I'm involved in now and have been involved in the past. Uh, the social justice lens is ever present uh, with me conceptually and personally, and certainly in my actions uh, as I move through my research. Next slide, please. So there are a number of questions that I pose call framing questions. One question is, what have American race relations taught us about social justice and clinical research? One is race relations have limited our education, creative and scientific imagination, ability and cure of and treatment of diseases. One of the words that I've been using in my head and for my colleagues, is not just scientific imagination, but reimagination. I, I like to think, and I do believe that I've had an excellent education. I went to excellent schools from elementary all the way through my postdoc. But one of the things I realized, the more educated I became, my imagination was being restricted and constricted. So at some point in my career, I decided that I'm gonna reimagine. If I reimagine a world with social justice, how would I walk through life? How would I relate to my students? How would I frame my research questions? How would I collect my sample? How would I write my proposal? How would I publish my work? So race relations can stifle that in terms of 
racism, structural, personal, interpersonal, institutional. So I would encourage all of us to not just have a scientific imagination because a lot of our influences have been affected by racist structures, reimagine a better world, a better question, a better way of seeing a sample, a better way of collecting a sample. So race relations have also limited evidence to support addressing healthcare needs and health policies of diverse groups of people in the American society. So if we reimagine and expand our current scientific imagination, and look at the limits of our education, use what we can, apply it when it's appropriate and expand our education, we now can move into, am I treating this patient the way that I need to? Did I learn how to communicate with this person based on the evidence that I was taught in graduate school, in medical school, or nursing school, or in theoretical sociology as I did at Northwestern University. So these are questions that I think as we move through the 21st century and think about the future, it is in my thinking, a time for reimagining scientific ways of viewing the world and problems. The next slide, please. Another question that helps us frame is why is incorporating social justice ideology, concepts and approaches key to, to clinical research? I think I've answered part of it already. For one, it provides a comprehensive understanding about a people's history, social determinants of health, political power and, pre, and representation. When we have a social justice lens, we also look for evidence to support addressing the healthcare needs and health policies of people in the society in general. So when I'm faced with, let's say the indigenous people in North Carolina, I study the history. What is this tribe's history? What are the social determinants of health that have shaped their life course? What are the political powers bearing on their everyday life and representation or lack thereof that would affect what I see and understand. So when I include all of that, I know I'm not only imagining my research and creating some research questions, I'm trying to throw away some of the things that have stifled the ability to reimagine. What is it about the history that I need to know? Should I even trust what the history book is telling me? Where can I get other evidence to support the historical record to really understand what these people have experienced so that I will know what I need to ask of them? Next slide, please. I think this is my last framing question. What are clinical, <clears throat> what are clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease teaching us about social justice and clinical research. One, social, educational, economic, and political norms and practices have shaped and informed a non-inclusive science to study Alzheimer's disease. So when I read the literature and I look at the samples, and I've taught my students this over the years, let's start our discussion in some of my classes, let's go straight to the sample. And of course I know what the sample is. And then I say to them, this is all we're gonna learn right now about these kinds of people. It's not broad enough, it's not comprehensive enough. And to what extent can we interrogate, not the validity of what they found, but the relevance and the generalizability of a non-inclusive sample. So what is learned from non-inclusive clinical trials will remain non-inclusive in diagnosing, treating, and developing healthcare policies to, ad to, to address dementia in diverse populations. And so this whole notion of how much do I really know 
And how much should I know? How much should I expand what I know to be inclusive when I'm being taught from a non-inclusive paradigm? Next slide, please. So at this point, I want to link social justice and clinical research a bit more. Uh, the first idea is that individuals should not be denied a number of, of, of influences that shape people's lives. And the idea, the last point on this slide is the idea of social justice can be applied across all of these. I'm I feel like I'm repeating myself. And we must ensure that policies and social conditions are informed by the social justice lens. Next slide, please. Now, I've, I've challenged myself, and I hope I'm challenging you as well in the audience, to really think about one, interrogate your learning. Interrogate what shaped your learning. Interrogate the application of your learning. And equally important, interrogate where you're gonna go with that learning in clinical research around Alzheimer's disease. So for me, I've used this word, a sense of readiness. Am I ready? to do this? Have I learned enough? Do I know enough? How should I go about this? So readiness is the state of being fully prepared to perform a task, job, and willingness to do something. Readiness is objective, reading an article, going to a webinar, taking another class, and it's subjective in me. How do I interpret this? Can I understand the application of this? So objective is having skills, knowledge, and understanding of a topic. The subjective part is that social, emotional, historical, or intellectual connection with the topic. Am I connected to this enough that I can get out of the boundaries of my formal education? That's not to throw away because for me, and I'm sure for all of you, there's a lot of formal education that, that took place and I can't start over. <laughs> it's too late for that. But I am interrogating, am I ready? So the readiness is self-reflective in the sense of self-examination in terms of the abilities, the skills, the insights, the interconnections with other people and readiness in aging research cannot occur at this present time in my thinking. And I'm not alone in this, by the way. I don't have a lot of followers on this, but I think we need a paradigm shift. It's time to rebake the cake, if we use that as a metaphor. I am a pretty good pound cake baker. And I know something about that. You can finesse baking and we often know that we can finesse research. But we need something more than finessing the situation. Like I'm gonna get, instead of having 5% African-Americans in the sample, I'm gonna get 10%. Or for the indigenous people, instead of having 2%, I'm gonna get 3%. Finessing it at that level won't work. So I've pushed for a sense of readiness, a formal and informal sense of readiness, which leads us to a paradigm shift. Next slide, please. So what is a paradigm shift in this discussion? A paradigm shift is a fundamental change in scientific assumptions and the practice of science. By the way, this is one of my favorite discussions. It changes and the way scientists think, think about and conceptualize the problem, new skills and expertise are evident. So are we gonna go back to school? Are we gonna take a class? Are we gonna go on a webinar? Or, or am I gonna go back and reread something and read it in a different way with a different set of lens? So we know in the paradigm shift, we start questioning the skills we have. 
And one of my favorite books of all time is The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn. So in Kuhn challenges us to ask new questions, develop new measures or refine the ones we've used. Reject old information and findings that no longer fit new knowledge that is being generated. And so when I have taught my students, let's go to the sample. And I say to them, this is all we're gonna learn about today are these people. How much can we generalize from this selective sample to the other population? When this population that is that in, in the non-inclusive approach to the science, may be poorer, live in a different region, may have a different age distribution, a different set of social determinants of health and a historical background. So that means that at some point, we may have to reject what we know to move on to an inclusive sample. Or if we don't reject it, I strongly encourage us be limited in applying what we've learned from non-inclusive research to inclusive research. Next slide, please. So the paradigm shift also encourages us to use, a, use cultural reflexivity where researchers become aware of their analytic focus and relationship to the field and study and community. Sometimes, you know, we learn a methodology. This is what this, this, this is that first bullet is about. It really is about being wedded to our disciplines, the analytic focus that I got you know, how I was grounded in graduate school, what my dissertation taught me, what I learned at the conferences. Now, one of the ways to, re to interrogate ourselves and to reimagine and to imagine moving to the next level of an inclusive way of studying uh, diseases like Alzheimer's disease is we question the applicability of our analytic focus and how we are wedded to a certain view of our field because that may put us in question as to the applicability of that. So if we do that, then we can overcome misrecognition of cultures by invoking culture in a contextualized and nuanced way. What that's saying to us is that I'm not going to allow my cultural socialization, the socialization, the understanding of cultural socialization from my basic learning, formal learning, when I'm in a new culture or a culture that I'm not aware of. What are the limitations? And I wanna pause and say at this point, it is not about rejecting all of what we know. It's about learning the limitations of our knowledge and expanding on the applicability of our knowledge by adding new knowledge. Not only read an article with 5% black and then at the end and say, they were hard to get. Well, we wanna interrogate sentences or statements like that. If they were hard to get, first, why did you get funded? Secondly, after you couldn't get them, what did you do? How did you step outside of your normal way of collecting your sample to better assure you got a sample? That's being wedded to an analytic focus. When we don't interrogate those limits, we end up with, they were hard to get in journals like JAMA. So researchers attend to ways that cultural practices involve consciousness and commentary on themselves. I ask myself this sometimes, do I know enough about what I'm trying to understand here and do? So that interrogation and that consciousness of commentary keeps us on our toes. It allows us to question the basis of our knowledge and continue to grow in knowledge and the applicability of our knowledge as we know it and as we expand it. Next slide, please. So the paradigm shift in Alzheimer's disease looks like this in my thinking. Then the old paradigm, researchers are unprepared. We use statements like hard to get populations, inconvenient samples, distrust, non-relevant questions, 
culturally irrelevant measures, limited use of social determinants of health. Findings do not fit the culture, racial or ethnic groups. So the new paradigm would suggest that we identify and discard assumptions about racial ethnic groups that were often learn in a formal way and informal way. And it gets back to my earlier slides about the different forms of racism that are part of the American fabric that not only shape us as individuals, but shape institutions as well, like the educational system, healthcare systems, political systems, protective systems. And so we have to Think about what did we learn in those systems that may be affecting the assumptions I'm making about people. And by the way, I interrogate myself around these assumptions as well. We need a new workforce, a different workforce in this new paradigm. We're ready, but not recruited populations. We have inclusive sampling frames there. We develop partnerships with communities. We questions are asked in cultural contexts. Measures are developed in cultural contexts. I developed a measure oh, about 10, maybe 15 years ago called the cultural justification for caregivers. Uh, I'm proud to say, and, and I say proud in the sense that not personal pride, but I'm proud for the work that the scientists are trying to do when they ask if I can use your measure reinterpreted in my language, applied in my culture. And I always send the measure to them with the psychometrics. And I ask for one thing, send me back your version of it in your language, in your culture, and let me know how it worked. The next point here is social determinants of health are key in understanding where we need to be in the new paradigm because through social determinants of health, we can understand the nuance and false focus concentration on such, such things as economics and education. Where we live has a lot to do with how we die as well. Where we live has something to do with food supply healthcare supply, the quality of education. These are the terminus of health. And so these are factors that need to be a part of the reimagining and the new paradigm. Make our findings useful and relevant. And lastly, have some co-equal responsibilities between the scientists and communities. Communities have taught me a lot. Uh, I did some work in uh, with some colleagues at Cambridge University uh, some maybe five years ago or so. And we learned a lot uh, together. Uh, I was sitting uh, at uh, Cambridge University with my colleagues and they were talking about the populations out in Ely. And as they were describing the populations, I said, it sounds like the Eastern part of North Carolina. And what I've learned from the Eastern part of North Carolina what I did learn, my colleagues were able to use some of those insights because we knew that if we understood the people and the people helped us understand them, we would better be in, we would be better informed and we would be approximate approximate the questions that were relevant to their lives. So when we co-create with community members. We then co-understand how to approach the problem. That has been a constant learning curve in my research over the years. And I'm still on that learning curve. Next slide, please. A new paradigm of social justice now, what would it look like? So we've talked about the social justice, the new paradigm, so what now would it look like if we married these two things? When we use a social justice framework, it recognizes the larger systemic context of past and ongoing abuses. We recognize hesitancy of people wanting to be in clinical trials because of history. 
Now, oftentimes when people are recruiting or they write up about recruiting African-Americans in clinical research, they mention the Tuskegee experiment, the syphilis study. And my mantra has always been, been discrimination is both distal and proximal. It isn't always about the history of racism. It is about what happened at the grocery store yesterday, what happened to my mother when I took her to the doctor, what happened at the pharmacy, what happened in the clothing store. All of these things become a part of that larger systemic context. It's not always about the history. It is also about the present. So we know that this new paradigm would use a bi-directional approach that is culturally meaningful and responsive. Getting back to that co-equal, having communities inform us, we inform communities. So it would be bi-directional. We use an, a community engagement model and that comes in different degrees. Some people are not trained in community engagement models. But if you get trained in that, we really can see the attributes of reciprocity, investment, empowerment, and bi-directional relationships that can really help us meet our scientific goals. Uh, one of the things that I would encourage this audience to look up on um, YouTube is during COVID, we all are, if we're not aware, a lot of communities were not serviced during COVID in terms of getting their shots. There is a YouTube video of this woman who really is a public health hero to me. It's called the Panola Project, P-A-N-O-L-A -A Project. She went around her community in a rural, predominantly black community in Alabama. And I think she got about 96% or 90 something percent of the people there vaccinated. The bi bi-directional relationship she created, she was a member of the community, but she knew things they didn't always know. She brought people to where she was. They brought her to where they were. And so as researchers, and I can say for me personally, I try to get where the people are. Can I understand them enough that I'm asking the right question? How can they educate me further? So the other part to this new paradigm is that I always say to my colleagues, and I've said it to several audiences, I would say multiple audiences now, that our proposals are off in terms of our timeline and our cost. Almost all presentations that I make in similar to this discussions, I, this discussion, I say our timelines are off. It takes longer to get the sample and it costs more. Now, the way that the NIH institutes are set up and the tradition of collecting, we can't get samples in those timelines because of the structural factors that have been created that prohibit the trust on both sides and the unpreparedness of researchers to be prepared to go out and get something quickly. And so when we write our proposals, I encourage anyone, everyone, including myself, extend your timeline and ask for more money for your sample selection, for your sample readiness to get ready in the community first and then ask the community to join you. That's the paradigm shift that's needed in terms of our timelines and recruiting and the cost in the budget for that. Next slide, please. Addressing the problem, the researcher creating an inclusive approach given all I've talked about so far. It involves expand recruiting beyond specialty care centers, use marketing strategies in the recruitment. Now to reduce participants, lack of access, fears of exploitation, fears of unattended outcomes, financial constraints, and competing demands. These are things that counter against us. So we know that the inclusive approach requires a rethinking, a reimagining, a rebudgeting, different timelines, 
for us to be where we need to get. That, those are my views and those are the experiences that I've had many years. In fact, I would say multiple decades now of reading proposals, writing proposals and engaging in research. We should not be reporting. They're hard to get. We should not allow in this culture a breakthrough drug having 0.6% African-Americans in the clinical trial. I will say and put on record, to me, that's not a breakthrough drug. It's not inclusive. And the people at greatest risk and at high risk for dementia were not put in the clinical trial. Next slide, please. So addressing the problem goes further in terms of successful partnerships that I've talked about. And there are a number of ways that we can develop these partnerships. That's critical to that way of addressing the problem, that paradigm shift that needs to happen. And in that shift, we are addressing problems such as how do I get my sample? So I put this slide in here because I've learned over, over the years and decades now, and from my colleagues, we need partnerships. We need colleagues as well who know and who are dedicated to this approach. But we also need community people to partner with us, to take us to a higher level while we're trying to get them to a higher level. That gets back to that co-equal sharing. Uh, and when I say co-equal, it's not 50-50, but people feel that they will be heard, that they have a partnership here, that they have power in the relationship whether they talk or not, or whether they have a suggestion that they, they feel empowered in that relationship. Next slide, please. So there are a number of conclusions that I'd like to check in what I've said so far, which has been a lot of words. Researchers committed to a diverse and inclusive approach use personal reflection and examination of one scientific research concerning race culture ethnicity and context. That gets back to cultural reflexivity. How do I examine how I've learned something? What did I learn? Was it expansive enough? Did it limit my imagination? Did anyone ever even teach me that I can reimagine something and not do it the way that is always published, even in JAMA? When, by the way, the samples may have 5% or 3%, of people at greatest risk for the disease. So we need to reimagine, rethink, reformulate, redesign, willing to reject engaging in and employing old ways of practicing science. So I'm at a place now that is just bad science. Let's forget the policy and the practice and the clinical intervention. Let's start with, is this even good science? that we're practicing. I taught Memphis courses for a number of years. And the one thing I do know, and my students, I taught them and they know this, like Research Methods 101, get a representative sample of the problem. So we can't claim certain groups are at high risk for a disease, but less than 1% of the clinical trial. That's just not ethical, unethical. That's bad science. Inclusive conceptual models are needed to guide the recruitment and retention. The recruitment and retention, that's a scientific approach. It's not just about counting people. We need to embed culture, race, ethnicity, and context in our models. Use measures that are reflective of the cultures and adapt the measures that, that are out there. They can be adapted and redesigned to fit these diverse groups. And I developed the cultural justification for caregiving scale because I could not find a measure to reflect what I wanted to know about the populations. We need to report our recruitment experiences, time and cost, so that institutions like the NIH institutes are aware of what it took to get this, how much time it took, and for us to change the field by reporting some of these data. Report results that reflect diversity and in, in, in inclusivity. 
and we need a more diverse America, apply and adhere to the established American law, such as the 1993 Revitalization Act. The Revitalization Act is not being adhered. We're out of compliance with it by the funders and by the funder that the people funded. If you go back and read the Revitalization Act and you read many of the articles that have been published with federal dollars and private donations, we are out of compliance with the Revitalization Act. Now, I question this. If I know this, don't the funders at NIH know this? Do the federal regulators know this? That gets back to my earlier slides about when structural issues, structural factors get into the system, like institutional racism, structural racism, gender bias, classism, laws can be broken easily. And there's no monitoring that's going on. So we need to work to bring organizational and institutional change to create diversity and inclusion in clinical research and other research initiatives. I'm gonna stop there and thank you for listening. Well, everyone, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Dilworth Anderson and given this really breathtaking presentation resonates on so many different levels. And I, I can tell from just following the chat and also some of these wonderful questions too that are coming through that it's resonated with you as well. I have a lot, is giving me a lot to think about and ponder and reflect upon as well. And why don't we get to some of these great questions that have been posed? And I've been, again, kind of curating these together for Dr. Dilworth Anderson. Let's just jump right in. First uh, question here came from Dr. Ed Ratner, geriatrician here at the Minneapolis uh, VA healthcare system. There's been recent debate about whether or not medical history should identify patients' race as a part of introductory information, for example, that, which commonly occurs with age and gender. Um, what is your opinion of that? Well, I think race is a, is a proxy uh, in the sense that it tells us a lot about uh, social determinants of health, health status, and other factors. Race as a biological concept, you know, the scientists have proven that to not be credible. And so what then do we use race for? Race is a social construct. We know that. And so if it's a social construct, use it as that. And what does a social construct mean? My social class, my level of employment, so if you look at race and you, and you look at income levels, there's a correlation between racial category and income. There's a, there's a correlation between race and health status. So race is a social construct, but we have practiced with race, use it in practice as a biological construct, which is not supported anthropologically or biologically. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Peggy. Next question I have is from Dr. Peter Whitehouse. Really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Whitehouse here with us again. Um, encourage all of you to check out his book that he published several years ago on the myth of Alzheimer's disease. Again, very provocative and again, thought, uh, thoughtful uh, work. And so Dr. Whitehouse asks, and, and I think you kind of addressed this in your presentation already, Peggy, but how justified, if at all, was the Alzheimer's Association in using their claim to represent voices of minorities to argue for full accelerated approval of Adjahelm? How, how, whatever. How, how justified was the Alzheimer's Association in using their claim to represent voices of minorities to argue for the full accelerated approval of the edge of home. Well, I, 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 I think they have the right to push whatever they want to push. This is America. This is the democracy uh, with a small D, by the way, in my world. Uh, and, and so you, that's, that's what a democracy is about. It's not about closing people down. It is about debating what people say and having counter arguments to that. And that's what Kuhn was talking about in the structure of scientific revolution. We have to debunk the existing paradigm to shift the focus. 
So I, I don't get into the nuts and bolts of why someone did something or should they have done something. Of course, I have my own personal views about this. Okay. But when I raise it to the level at which I'm discussing today, it is about in a democratic society and an independent organization can make their own judgment about what they want to do. Now, is there a counter argument to that? And should we have a counter argument? My answer to that is yes. We should have a counter argument to that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you, Peggy. So this is from Jessica Cassidy, um, huge fan of your work. She's very much enjoyed this presentation as have many others. And she was curious for your insights on ways that we can advance the use of culturally appropriate research methods in dementia related studies. Besides broadening our samples to include greater representation of diverse individuals, how should researchers ensure research methods are inclusive to diverse groups? Does Dr. Dilworth Anderson feel this important, this important towards achieving, that this is important towards achieving a paradigm shift and creating social justice? By having an inclusive sample toward lend, leading to a paradigm shift, is that the I, question? I think what Jessica is, is trying to get at here is beyond just broadening our samples, um, how, how else can we incorporate these key principles in our research methods well, that are, well, so they're inclusive to diverse groups? Yeah. Well, th that was part of a large part of what I was discussing. Mm -hmm. It's more than about sampling. It's a state, the cultural reflexivity for the scientists is getting wedded to how we were trained. Okay, I went to Northwestern for my master's, for my doctorate. Uh, and the Midwest Council for Social Research for my postdoc. Then I went back to Northwestern, which I typically don't put on my bio, for two years and became a family therapist. So it was like four years after my doctorate I studied. And one of the reasons I went back to school in family therapy to, to get clinical training was because when I was studying sickle cell families, and looking at intergenerational influence on the care of sickle cell children, I realized in talking to those mothers, I was just a fish out of water. I had no idea what those women and men and the mothers and fathers and grandparents were experiencing. I knew they were clinical issues, but I could not address them because the way I was trained, my culture, my reflexivity, I was trained to know what I knew. And what I knew didn't apply to what they were expressing. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, if I'm going to do this kind of research around chronic diseases and families, disease and family context, that's the way I framed it at that time, I really got to understand family <laughs> dynamics. I got to understand how families make decisions about health care. I got to understand the emotional part of health care seeking, health care in general. So I went back to school to really give me some clinical training. So when, when mothers and fathers and caregivers would say things to me, I use my clinical training right now in my research. I have never let go of it and I stay abreast of, of that. And so it's more than getting an expanded inclusive sample. It's about how one conceptualizes the problem. What are the measures that make sense in, in in, in conducting research. For example, the CESD is not a good measure for measuring depression among African-Americans. Mm. We know that. It's a very, it has poor validity and reliability for that. Now, it's used, it was used a lot in terms of measuring depression among caregivers, okay? And the African-American caregivers looked like they weren't depressed and they weren't this. Well. In the African-American culture, mm. we do not internalize a lot of emotional feelings that lead to depression around caregiving. The way that, that it leads to emoting those that depression, not to say there's no depression, but it tends to exacerbate itself through physical conditions, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. So it is also a way to know how do cultures express emotions? Mm -hmm. See, so that requires of us to rethink. Can emotions be expressed differently among different people? Absolutely. 
Arthur Kleinman's work has really informed this. Uh, the work of Arthur Kleinman and some anthropologists to really teach us that you really got to think about, I, I, this is not the depression that I was trained to yeah. see. I don't think they're depressed. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then I always say that's not true. You just don't know how to measure it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so my cultural justification scale, I found that we, we found a curvilinear relationship. The scale says when you get up to 40, your physical health declines. If you're down to 10, it was 10 to 40. The closer you got to 40, the worse your physical health. The closer you got to 10, the worse your physical health. Somewhere around 30 on the scale, the caregivers were taking care of themselves. So my cultural justification scale is a predictor of physical health of African-American caregivers. And this is why when different scientists around the world ask me about, can I use your scale and adapt it in my language? Mm -hmm. I wanna understand how to measure this. Mm -hmm. I always say, yes, I send them everything I know on it and all the things that have been used around it. And I, again, I ask back, send me what you found out in your culture because we're trained to think of depression in a unidimensional way. We are not unidimensional people. We have different social determinants of health. We have different histories. We have different ways of expressing ourselves. Yes, Black people do get depressed. So I can say this, you cannot go to church and say, I'm so depressed, I can't take care of my mother anymore. But you can go and say, in the last year, I've gained about 50 pounds and my blood pressure is up. Yeah, yeah. Since I've been caregiving for my mother. Right, right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now immediately that's a different way of expressing stress that I want to be trained to understand that's why I went back to school after my training yeah. after my postdoc to really get deep down into the people to understand them all right Peggy I'm gonna try something here we'll see how this works uh, Michael has his hands his hand raised and I think he would like to speak his question um, Michael, I'm going to allow you to talk now and let's see if this works. If it doesn't, my apologies, everyone, but we're going to try it. Michael, I'm going to quote unquote allow you to talk now. Can you hear me? We can, Michael. Please ask your question. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about yourself and your question for Dr. Dilworth Anderson. Fantastic. Uh, first of all, uh, th this was wonderful. I only wish I could understand everything you were saying, but I live with dementia. And I'm also recovering from COVID, so my brain is all fogged up. I, I have a real question for you here that I, I have been struggling with for 10 years now. I have been trying to change the paradigm shift for a hospital. In fact, it's the University of Pennsylvania, who, as you may know, is in an area that has Hispanics, African-Americans, yet their scientific requirement to get into clinical trials there is that you have to pay a certain amount of money to be tested first, which is unheard of, mm -hmm. as you probably know in, in the industry. I've tried to reach out to places like the Alzheimer's Association, they refuse to tackle things like this because they get funds. They, they, talk, they clearly told me, I have gone to places like NIH. They refuse to deal with this. I have gone to people such as yourself who was trying to tackle discrimination. How does somebody like me have an opportunity to change these things when nobody wants to tackle it? And as you know, African-Americans are twice as likely to get dementia. Hispanics are one and a half times. So to me, they are critical people that must be in the scientific arena being tested for this, yet they're the ones who are not getting in there. Thank you, Michael, for your critical question. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Dilworth Anderson. Please. Well, that's a big question. And, I, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my life trying to tackle that, Michael. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'd like to say, and I, I wanna share with the audience is that in June of 2021, I stepped down as full professor with tenure from Carolina, North, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The next day I was appointed research professor. 
And I have devoted my time and I am devoting my time to the people so that I can address just what Michael is talking about, okay? And when I say to the people, I'm trying to reimagine, <laughs> Michael, uh, things that are in the way. And there are a lot of structural things that are in the way, such as policies. Now, these are not abstract entities, by the way. People are applying the policies, okay? People are giving millions of dollars to researchers who restrict the science. Editors are publishing limited data. That's called institutional and structural discrimination and racism, okay? So when I read a, I pick up JAMA and I read an article, uh, every article I read, I go straight to the sample. I don't, I don't, I look at the title and then I'll say, let me look at the sample. Uh, now, a lot of times I read it just to say, here it is again. And a lot of times I read it, and even if it, hears it, it is here again, it's said in a different way. And so we need to stay on top of ourselves as scientists, and we need to interrogate, interrogate each other as scientists, not in the way of being punitive or criticizing the person, criticize the science. And if any of you have any time, do read The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn. It is a classic. Really, Kuhn was on it decades ago. That really teaches us what happens in disciplines and societies when we get wedded to ideas. The institutions foster them, create them, and reward them. So that's where we are, Michael. We're in a system of rewards of structural and institutional racism. Now, I alone cannot change that. You alone cannot change that. But having conversations like this today, this is one way that we need to converse with one another, challenge each other, challenge ourselves. I challenge myself all the time. I challenge myself in my knowledge and how much I know and how much I need to know. Uh, and again, that's why I went back to school and at the Institute of Psychiatry at Northwestern for two years and got clinical training in family therapy. I'm not a family therapist. I had a practice for a while, referral only, but I really went for the science so I can understand it. I'm not suggesting people go back to school for two years to do something, but I am suggesting that we expand on our knowledge, that we collaborate with people who can marry our knowledge. You know what I'm saying? We can complement each other's knowledge. So when we have diverse teams and diverse workforces, people come with different historical experiences. They come with different insights. A team of all Peggy's would not be recommended, okay? But I do recommend that we have a diverse team of thought, training, ideology. And right now, our scientific workforce is highly discriminatory. It is exclusive. It is primarily white, primarily male, highly funded. Now, if we're gonna to move toward finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease, we need to change our paradigms, we need to change our workforce, and we need to change the way that we're spending our taxpayers' money toward this disease. Those are big, those are big societal issues that in my lifetime, I hope I see some change. Wonderful, thank you, Peggy. So we have another question here. Uh, again, really great questions coming through here. This is from Paul Kleiman. Please address the interface of racism and ageism. Uh, Dr. Becca Levy's new book, Breaking the Age Code, is overview, an overview of life expectancy impact of ageist attitudes. And she does cross-reference racism and sexism. But what about the double jeopardy of race and age? Well, there, uh, well when you're uh, African-American, for example, I know a little something about that. Uh, age has something to do with it, but a lot of it has to do with life course. I'm a big believer in life course. That you grow old with a life of discrimination. And in our culture, age is, an older person is revered and supported. You know, we just, you know, grandmas, I, I'm a grandma now, I'm so happy about that. I've increased my status in life, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in my culture, I've reached the pinnacle uh -huh. uh, and uh, regardless of what America thinks of me. And, and so 
this whole notion of where do you fall in your cultural context? So it is not all about this, the larger society oftentimes, it's also the culture in which you're in. So age may not be a down in some cultures, it raises the status of a person in another culture. But in the global, when we think of it in the American society, uh, age has not been favored a lot because we value youth and we value middle age and, and we value people who are highly productive and older people are not perceived as highly productive in this capitalist system. Yes, or quite frankly, in the scientific system, when you talk yes. about productivity, what does that really mean, Peggy? Yes. I, mean, I think we know what it means and uh, how that's incentivized, which you've alluded to multiple times. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so this has been great. Um, again, there's so many questions. So I, I could go on about some of these too, but in, rather than that, let's get to our audience questions. And uh, similar question, both in the chat uh, by Venerine Brown Boatswain, who's a great friend of ours uh, here in Minneapolis, and Dr. Phyllis Moen. Um, Venerine asks, how can one challenge institutions when institutions decide who they want to listen to or not listen to? And relatedly, Dr. Moen asked, social organization change, organizational change is hard. Do you see this as a top-down project, a bottom-up project, or all hands on deck? I, th I thought those two questions, comments were somewhat uh, similar. Well, it's a lifetime project. <laughs> it's, it, it's less structural, but more procedural in my thinking. It is a lot about what you do at a certain time with certain people. I found that that, that to be very true in my, in my career and that, that of others. And I'm not an end of one. I'm just, I look at other people and the impact they can have on a field. I, I think in academia, we get disgusted and, and, um, and we feel rejected uh, and marginalized uh, when we don't get the grant, when we don't get uh, the article published in the high impact journal. While you're looking at a woman who has a queue of what I consider outstanding grants uh, sitting in queue at NIA. Yeah. Uh, and someone said to me, well, you were ahead of your time, Peggy. Uh, uh, that's, and, and the review committees didn't really yeah. get it. Yeah. No, I wasn't ahead of my time. Uh -huh. I, I wasn't ahead of my time. I was at a different time. I was walking at a different beat. The paradigm did not appreciate the beat. But what I've learned to do and that of others, and mostly from my ancestors, we created our own beat. Mm. So we decided that if I don't fit here, I know where I fit. I create my fit. That's why I created the cultural justification for caregiving scale. Nothing would fit to make sense of what the caregivers were telling me. Through a lot of good methods I, I learned at Northwestern University on how you get focus groups, how you get feedback loops. Those 10 items took months to get, believe it or not, <laughs> and to get the psychometrics on it and then pilot that and then work with that scale. So now it's used globally. So this is what I have encouraged younger researchers and any researcher. Uh, the, sh the shift in knowledge, shift in knowledge always occurs. Are we invested enough to take the time and take the, the licks that, goes with, that go with the, with the shift? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? If yeah. that makes sense. Because what Thomas Coons points out in his book you don't, you don't meet, you don't follow the, the mainstream. So that's going to be some rejection. So what does that mean for us as academics? It might mean not getting a grant. It may mean not getting tenure. It might mean a lot of things. And those are high risk stakes. Mm -hmm. And I would be the first to say, be cautious of that. But if we don't think about shifting and taking the risk, then we stay where we are. We, we create breakthrough drugs that have 0.6% of high-risk people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense to me. Right. Now, right. in my education, that's poor science. That's bad mm -hmm. science. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. You know, those of you that were here earlier, Dr. Dilworth Anderson and I were talking a little bit about that. And 
you're right. It is poor science. Now, to the credit, I think to many in the scientific community, they spoke up about that. And, you yes. know, uh, if yes. not from the, the very critical aspect of representation, which probably should have been elevated even more than it was exactly. but from the standpoint of, you know, scientifically, this just isn't working uh, for mm -hmm. the people who it needs to work for. And exactly, um, you know, well, the, the, the pushback is legitimate. Right. By some of us, uh, the pushback is legitimate in terms of representation for the people. We, I think of our science as representatives of the people. Yeah. And this is why at this juncture in my career, I really want to spend time examining what I've learned, what I don't know, so that the people can benefit from whatever knowledge I gain right. and the in, in collaborating with people. I'm enjoying the new trial I'm involved in, new ideas. It, mm -hmm. it is some of the best methodology that we've been able to put together on community engagement. Yes. And we're documenting every step of the way so that we can get an inclusive sample of Hispanics and mm -hmm. African-Americans, mm -hmm. rural communities, mm -hmm. urban mm -hmm. communities. And so the trial will be representative of people at greatest risk for this disease. Right. Thank you so much, Peggy. You know, related to that, I thought this was a really uh, great question here that was submitted was, I love Dr. Dilworth Anderson's imagery about losing imagination when practicing science over time. It was very powerful. I am experiencing faculty shutting down my creativity. How do you recommend doctoral students keep true to their creativity when the structure of some programs put down creativity, especially when you are a minor minority student and your mentors are 90% white men and women? That's a tough one. That's a tough question. That's a tough predicament to be in. There, there, are not a, there are some options. One, you can leave and go to another place, but you got to figure out, is that place going to be worse than where you are or about the same? And it also might mean bringing in an invited member of your committee, committee that's different from the current committee members that have power in their discipline to bring another voice to the table mm -hmm. because students are often unempowered in those situations, I feel not non-powered. And, and so it also can mean that even with all the pushback, you have another set of people that are not formally in your circle, but informally help you navigate that system so that you know how to communicate with people who don't buy into your perspective, who don't see your questions as relevant and meaningful. Uh, because their paradigm has another set of meaningful questions and, and methodologies, you know. Uh, and, and I must say to the credit of my uh, mentor at Northwestern, Howard Becker, who's a renowned sociologist, yeah. he told me, I, and I'm paraphrasing him, you know, it's not like he was doing aging. Uh, you know, I predate NIA. <laughs> there was no NIA when I was at Northwestern. <laughs> And so I wanted to, and I did my yes. dissertation on what we call the black agent. Okay. So Howard introduced me to Bernice Newgard. Oh, okay. Right, right. Who was at University of Bernice Chicago, right? was yep. a pioneer in yep. aging. She's and, and like one of the, she quick, and the Shannas. Yeah. Qu a quick side note. I mean, Dr. Newgard, I believe was the advisor of Dr. Steve Zaret, who was my advisor. And so, exactly. You know, so exactly. So these things and, linked and, together. And, and Bernice was at the University of Chicago and I was up in Evanston, Chicago, you know, it's on the <laughs> South side and Evanston is on the, on the North end of things. And I get on the train and we had lunch together. And I tell you, until she died, she was one of these quiet mentors of mine. Yeah. Well, not that I had opposition, but she brought a different quote unquote flavor to my imagination because she herself was a pioneer. Mm -hmm, you see, mm -hmm. Bernice, it was a white female, okay? But she cared about aging. She cared about what I cared about. She gave me validity and, 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 and reinforced my ideas. And fortunately, I end up, ended up being president of the Gerontological mm -hmm. Society myself. Mm -hmm. And the first meeting I went to, which she said, you need to learn how to go to these meetings, Peggy. Yeah. Join this. I said, what? Okay. I think I saw three Black people there. <laughs> but I kept going. Yeah. I kept going. So I would encourage stepping outside of your box, getting reinforced by other voices to counter some of the voices that you find to be 
not supported. Learn a different way to communicate with them so they can hear you in a clearer way and a more supportive way. And you may have to meet them halfway because a lot of what we all learn as senior people, we learned after we got our doctorates. Yeah, you know, that's true. That's very you, true. You Boy, learn a lot. Right about that. You yeah. know. And so yeah. you're yeah. going to learn a lot beyond where you are now. So if you're not in a place where you can move, learn better communication, different communication, get a support system, and not just academically, but spiritually, take care of yourself, take care of your body, take care of your mind, and pamper yourself, give yourself something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful, Peggy. I, I'm going to leave it on that note because I think that's a perfect closing to this really robust conversation we've had. My apologies to those of you who have asked additional questions and comments we didn't get a chance to get to. There was so much rich discussion here, and I think in some, in many ways, Dr. Dilworth Anderson covered some of the questions and comments you had. Just to wrap up here again, a very excellent 2022 Robert L. K. Memorial Lecture. You can see why Dr. Dilworth Anderson is a true pioneer in this space and why we were so thrilled and humbled to have her here with us today. And I think many of you agree based on the chats that I'm seeing. Quick uh, logistical notes again. Remember, uh, Ms. Millenbaugh, Ashley will be emailing all of you uh, copies of the slides as well as the recording. Um, and we'll also be posting this on the Robert L. Kane Memorial uh, Lecture website as well. I just wanted to close with a couple of very quick reminders for all of you. If you liked uh, today's presentation and would like to join us for some of the other many events that we're going to be having up really in the next few weeks, if you're caring for someone with memory loss or uh, you're a professional and would like tools and resources on, on how to approach this, please join us on Saturday, June 4th for our Caring for People with Memory Loss Conference. This is a hybrid event, so you don't have to be here in Minnesota to join. We'll have people in person as well as hybrid. You can see here, we're gonna be touching on some great topics ranging from how to manage a dementia-related behavioral expression to a transgender and non-binary older adults, what they need as they age into care. Also talking about rural dementia care, very key uh, and important topic. So again, if you're interested, this information will be shared with you vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Ashley's email. Also, uh, several of you were on the call today. Uh, our Bold Public Health uh, Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving is uh, about to hold a national conference on the public health opportunities and challenges of dementia caregiving. How can we make dementia caregiving a public health priority? And we are going to have a very exciting pre-conference kickoff event on June 8th. Um, Dr. Fayron Epps and colleagues will be uh, giving a webinar on public health and faith really how faith community organizations really serve as a key public health entity, particularly in the space of dementia care. We have just a tremendous panel pulled together for this and we hope you can join us for this exciting webinar. And finally, as I mentioned, join us here in Minnesota, June 14th and 15th, the weather should be good on uh, for this national conference. It's free to attend and again, hybrid options are available. So with that, I thank all of you for joining us uh, for the 2022 Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Dr. Dilworth Anderson, for such a provocative, wise, and thoughtful uh, uh, presentation and dialogue. And again, we hope all of you reach out to us, engage with us here at the University of Minnesota. Um, love to have you at future events. And uh, let us know if there's anything we ever can do to help. Otherwise, thank you, Peggy, and take care, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, Peggy. Take care now. Bye, everyone. Thank you.